enforce that 7304. You guys can hear? Is it is that the case? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. So what I'll do today is um, focus on project two and also uh, continue to overview continuous time Markov chains. And you'll also have uh, continuous time Markov chains, uh, a big exercise in the tutorials today. Are there any questions before we start? And I'll, I'll turn on the camera on the computer in a sec as well. Hey, uh, Yoni, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, just a bit of a rough day at work today. If, if I leave, and, and will, this, will this one be put online uh, later on? Yeah, it will, um, right. and, and not with a delay. So you saw the others online, and I remember yeah, yeah. The Th NBC Th News is not there. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. Have a good weekend, Yoni. All right, have a good day. Thanks. He's recording it. That's the main thing. Yes, so we hope. It's just that um, I've been having trouble where sometimes network recordings come late and sometimes I've tried to upload to YouTube and there's trouble and sometimes I have no excuse. So it's a combination of different time, different things. Yeah, because um, I, yeah, I noticed when I was looking at the lectures you put up, I think there's a two from before the break that didn't go up. I'm not sure if that was because you didn't record them or when they went missing with the server or what <laughs> oh so okay those i don't have so i i put i did a clear and put up everything i kind of had recordings of um yeah so i i hope you'll survive without those ask me any specific questions that are needed um yeah at the moment i'm right i'm just thinking like when i come back to study for exams and i find the lectures not there <laughs> Um, yeah. Just read well, the textbook, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's in the textbook. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I can answer any questions you have at any point. Um, all right, so now I can see your chat, etc. Sorry for a slightly slow delay. Let's get with it. So we're in project number two. 25% of the grade uh, should be a bit easier, actually, than project number one. Um, also, because you've already kind of gone to fitness with project number one, but there's not a huge big question in this project. There's a multiple small questions. In this hour, let's uh, kind of decipher uh, what this project is about, uh, get a few things going, and um, take it from there. So of course, it's on uh, chapter EM3, okay? Uh, however, I must say that, you know, our usage of the chapter, we, we don't use most of the things in, in that chapter. Uh, the, the chapter does a lot of things in kind of a classic way. And we, uh, in a sense of, we don't have a good computer that can compute matrix exponentials, nor are we able to do Monte Carlo. And we're going to do a lot of things with Monte Carlo. Still, having that chapter is good. We're in continuous time. Okay, enough with this discrete time stuff. So we're in continuous time that you know already. And you think of a population. That population is not too big, so maybe a hundred or maybe a thousand, maybe five thousand. Uh, word of caution: the notation here, uh, the notation that we have in this uh, assignment, does not always agree with the notation of the book chapter EM3. Okay, so EM3 might have different notation. All right. So, for example, for us, n is a total number of individuals in the population on this beautiful small island. So before we were uh, 500 kilometers west in Roma, the city, uh, the town Roma, 500 kilometers west of here, also beautiful, now we're in a beautiful island, different. Okay, in the population you have S sub T, that's the number of susceptible people. Susceptible person implies a person is susceptible to a disease, okay, um, but doesn't have it and has not had it before, maybe had it, but there's no record of that in her or him. And, um, IT is the number of infected people. That's the number of infected people with a disease. And RT, uh, RT stands for either recovered or removed. Uh, we'll call them here removed, right? If you think of something like COVID, then RT is either uh, recovered, which is most of the people who are, unfortunately, a few are, are dead. Uh, so, so removed is kind of both of them. All right. Uh, but if you're recovered, then you're assumed to be immune. Okay. That's I think happen. it's more than a few dead now. Yeah, unfortunately, but unfortunately, you know, re, 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 in, in, in relative proportion. No, but if you look at the yeah. removed, most of the removed are recovered. Yeah. Right. Okay. Proportionally speaking, it's small. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. 
uh, in general, we consider uh, three constants. So this is now we're going to have like kind of a conglomerate of a whole bunch of models together. Um, all right. So we've got these three constants and there are SI. That, that stands for the rate of transfer from S to I. Now be careful. RSI is not your instantaneous rate because that rate is like the rate constant. And that's why uh, we called it the constant for the rate. So that's from S to I. So that's, that's a parameter. All these parameters are um, non-negative. You've got RIS. That's transfer from infected to susceptible. And you've got RSR. That's from susceptible to recovered. Okay. Uh, so the first is from that, etc. Okay. Uh, that's that's these are these three parameters. Now we we're going to have four models. Not all, all of these parameters play a role in each of the models. Okay. The models get more complex as we move down. So and these are the four models: model one, model two, model three, model four. So model one is called the susceptible infected. The way this model works, it's like. Uh, like herpes, you get it, you never stop. Okay, you keep it forever. You, 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 you know, you're, we're all susceptible. If you're infected, you stay infected with it. That's it. Okay, that's that's model one, susceptible infected. Okay, and we don't speak about you leaving a population, etc. So, and that's actually section three point one. So, in a sense, it's very simple, right? You've got everybody's kind of healthy, susceptible. Maybe there's one or two or three infected, and the number of infected grows and grows. So in this model, RSI is positive, but the other two constants, they don't play a role, okay? And R of T is kind of equivalent to zero all the time. So you've got no removed. So that's the SI model. Second model is called the SIS model, susceptible, infected, susceptible. Now, a word of caution, if you guys will Google these models, most of what you'll find is the deterministic analogs. And I've suggested in the reading guide that you watch a video about the SIR that was given here at UQ in one of the pandemic seminars, but you've got a whole bunch of stuff about SIR in general. So this is like the classic ODE model that you have, but you also have ODE models for these guys, okay? But we're not doing the ODE models, we're doing the continuous time Markov chain model. By the way, whenever this project says Markov chain, we mean continuous time Markov chain, and that's what I stated. Okay, so in the SIS, you've got RSI positive and RIS positive. Okay, so you can move from S to I and I to S, uh, but there's no removal and still removal is zero. So there's still only two compartments. By the way, these are sometimes called compartments, compartments. So you take the population and you put them in different compartments. It's called a compartmental model. You know, each individual is tagged as, is she S, is she I, is she R, okay? I mean, in more uh, elaborate models, you have more compartments. But these are kind of the basic epidemiological models. The previous models you did in the previous exercise were only for a household, okay? And, and that's where discrete time was kind of, had some classic models. Okay, now we're getting to the, the central model, SIR, okay? And that's what the book calls the general epidemic, okay? The general epidemic, it's, it appears here, okay? So you can move from S to I. You cannot move from I to S, okay? That's a zero. You cannot move from I to S, All right? So if you're infected, you will never become susceptible again, okay? So that means you're only gonna move from S to R after you are removed, you know, and uh, you, you then have immunity. Uh, in this project, we just assume all the time that the disease is, uh, it says non-lethal, so removed means immune, okay? So no death, yeah, it's like easy going, all right? Um, so this is maybe uh, measles or something like that, that after you've been infected by it, you, you're uh, forever immune. I think that's the case with measles. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, okay, then there's kind of just to, to have something a bit more, there's a model which we call SISR, that's not a standard name, and that also means that you have this other constant, um, R, um, blah, 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 R, um, R, S, R, this one, you know, R, S, R, no, R, R, S. Oh, oh no, R, I, S, sorry, R, I, S is also positive. So that just means that 
after you finish being infected, maybe you gain immunity and maybe not, which actually people are worried that that's the case for COVID-19, okay? So it's not that you just move from infected to removed, you can move either to removed or to susceptible, which is quite bad, right? If you had something like COVID and had to move back. All right, so that's, that's this model. Questions so far? No, all right. Um, all right, so now these models are described by several Markov chains that you're actually gonna specify in problem one. So I'll give you some guidance for that uh, and the tutors as well, uh, because it's kind of central that you specify these Markov chains in, in a sensible manner. There's not a, always an exact unique specification between the model and the Markov chain. I mean, a Markov chain is simply a description of a collection of random variables and their dependent structure. That's what a Markov chain is. A model, you know, the model, and there could be different ways of what you do with these random variables, but there aren't, aren't too many degrees of freedom. Yet. Now, in general, there's the following types of transitions. And the most important one in all of these is what we call the law of mass action. Okay. And the law of mass action simply says that if you've got here these people, I'm going to put these people here. They're the, uh, this is key. Okay, so this is S of T are those. Okay, or these, these are the susceptibles. Okay, and these here, the red ones are the infected. Okay. I mean, this is like a snapshot in time t. So I should actually say S of t infected, there are uh, four and susceptible, there are okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Come on, you can do it, computer, iPad, seven. All right, seven, seven susceptibles, all right? Now, the total number of interactions at any small delta time to any time is, is seven times four. Okay, that's the total number of interactions. That's the total number of interactions. And then you multiply these interactions by your constant, which happens to be, we denote it R from S to I. Okay, so at this given time, this here, this is the rate of spread of the disease because each one of these dudes, let's do them in, in orange, you know, can, can touch one of the uh, infected. So each, oops, not that line, right? Can touch one of the infected. So if you assume kind of perfect mixing, etc. so the product of the, yeah, so this was S of T times I of T, okay? times is constant, okay, R I sign. Okay, that's, that's all. Okay, a lot of colors for something simple, but this is central, so this is kind of the, that's a central assumption in these kind of epidemical module, models, and that's called the law of mass action, that's also described in the book EM, et cetera, but it kind of says, well, if you've got a whole, if you've got perfect mixing of the population and everybody's kind of moving around, da, 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 da. so at any given time, the number of interactions is a product of the number of S's and the number of I's, okay? And that's gonna give you the rate, where this is just a constant of, well, how fast is this rate, um, What's this rate? Okay, Any questions about that? All right, so then if you, if you look at this, then now you say transitions from S to I are at a rate RSI times this product, ST times IT, and then we threw in a whole bunch of complications, all right? So this one complication here is this function C, oops, let me do it like that is this function C sub T, which is in general a function of both time and of the state. Yeah, this is the state, the state of the system, okay? So in a sense, you could think of this function as modifying this constant, okay? So this function comes to say, this is C stands for contact. You know, maybe there is social distancing. So social distancing means that you're actually putting lines between these guys, right? And they are not seeing each other as much. So then the function C of T is low. Or maybe there isn't social distancing. Maybe you're pushing everybody to mix. 
So this is kind of a state dependent function and a time dependent function. There's a difference between being state dependent and time dependent. When you do time dependence, just the time axis moves, you know, and, and you, you're all the time a function of the time. State is something stochastic, right? So given the state, what's going to be your social distancing function? The other component which we have is this A, just another constant, which is like exogenous infection. Exogenous means from outside. So you can think, you know, maybe there's like just you're going to infect and it's not a function of who, who is here. You also think there's this other planet here of bats or something. They're not another planet, it's just on trees or whatever. And they're kind of infecting you with rate A, if A exists. Okay, but the core is this, is S times I, times a constant. Capish? All right. Um, so, you know, that's the law of mass action. Uh, da, da, da. In addition, the value is state dependent, time varying, not specified. So if you don't specify, then just think of C of T as being a constant one. Okay, indicates law of contact. So you can control that via social distancing. We only use that in one question or two. And the parameter A, if you don't specify it, is zero. Okay, so there's none of this bad stuff. Okay, so that's how infection occurs. All right. The second component which we have is how do we uh, stop being infected, okay? So stopping being infected is just proportional to the number of infected. So at any given time, let me erase here a few things. Let's, let's look now at these poor infected people. Hi, Mr. Infected. Hi, Mrs. Infected. Hi, infected, hi, infected. These guys are infected. There are four of them at this time. There's four of them. At any given time, they're all kind of almost getting healthy, almost getting healthy, almost getting healthy, almost getting healthy. They're getting healthy each at, a, at an individual rate of RST. Okay, that's the rate. So the total rate of reducing the number infected, the total rate of reducing this by one is I of T times RIST. Okay, because there's four of them at that given time. Once this one has become kind of healthy, okay, so she's become healthy, right? So this has become three, you know, and R of T becomes one, right? And then there's just three, so the rate is no longer four times R of T, but it's three times R of T. Okay. Um, similarly, from uh, infect, sorry, this is infected to susceptible. I made a mistake. All, all I said now, all I said now, uh, R S I few things I made a mistake here. So so I, I spoke about this actually now. So um uh this is typo. Oh my god. Typo. This should be an I I'll fix this. Okay. This is I to R. Okay. So infected, I'll take a photo of this. RSR, yes, be RSR. I also know it's a typo a bit earlier, but it's not a serious one. <laughs> what, what is it? Go ahead and tell me. You said something, you just left a word out. It said some, we are going to, um, yeah, it says we, we will with the following models. We will with the following models. Oh. <laughs> yeah. See, I read this again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Thank you. All right. Good point. Okay. No problem. Two virtual points for you. No worries. All right. Thanks. Uh, and Matt Richard said, should RSR be RIR? Yes. That's what Matt Richard said. Recover your immunity the same way. Uh, R. Uh, Matt, did I get this? This is on this one. Yep. Yes. Yeah, thanks, man. Same. Okay, so yeah, this situation was here specific to, you know, you get from infected to recovered, okay? That's that. Um, but you also have from infected to susceptible, which means that, you know, that's like with a cold, right? When you have the common cold, I'm infected with a cold, I recover. I'm unfortunately again susceptible to my cold. My other child comes from school with a cold. Oh, thank you very much for the cold, I get the cold. And cover, etc. Okay, so that's this. the last one is not so, uh, uh, it's above in models one. Yeah, okay, thanks, man. You said it's above mo models one, four, R. Okay, 
will fix here. Thanks. Okay, so there'll be an updated online version of this. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a few typos of these constants there. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, and the last type of action is from removed or recovered, if we'd like, to susceptible. And what does this mean? It means that you kind of uh, lose your immunity, right? So you're in recovered, chilling out, happy. So you're now this uh, kind of green person. Let's say that this one's also green. So let's say our recovered is two, okay? And then these guys at a rate kind of become again um, susceptible, okay? You lost your immunity. So that occurs at, at the rate B. Uh, I guess we could have just used the constant uh, R, R, S for that. Okay, but most of the time we'll just assume that B is uh, zero. I mean, we won't get to that. Okay, so most of the, the typical thing you do with an SIR model is, you know, you assume everybody's kind of been recovered and the epidemic finishes. So this thing, even though if it, it exists, it's often insignificant. Uh, but we'll have a few discussions on this. So consider the parameters A and B and the CT, this is like the function C of T, as model extensions, and initially they assume there are zero, zero, and this one's one. Okay, so they don't play well. All right, any more questions or typos or anything like that? All right, um, here are the questions. So let's see, we might not describe all of them, but let's, let's get to the core of them. Um, so the first one, you just assume a small population so you can write things out nicely and you get a feel for it. So just three people in the per population and describe the continuous time Markov chains for its model by specifying the meaning of the state and the generator matrix, okay? The generator matrix of the continuous time Markov chain is the matrix that has the generator matrix Q okay so Q I J equals rate of I to J when I does not equal J or minus sum over K not equaling I Q I K if I equal J right and this is sometimes you denote we denoted that by lambda I Okay, that's a generator matrix. Okay, it's a matrix with rows summing to zero. Okay, and that's a common way of specifying a continuous time Markov chain. So sometimes we just specify the rates and don't write the matrix directly. Okay, but you could also just specify the matrix. Uh, certainly, all these models are finite uh, states. Sometimes the state will be big, but they're a finite state. Um, now, for models one or two, the Markov chain is just going to be so the sequence of random variables with with some generator matrix like that uh, will just have the state space zero one two and three okay so you're, you're going to have what we call a one-dimensional markov chain now this is an informal concept when we say one-dimensional markov chain or a two-dimensional markov chain or whatever i mean a markov chain is just a stochastic process over a state space that is countable you can treat that stochastic process as being points in two dimensions or in five dimensions or just in some arbitrary set if you like. The thing is that they're countable, they're a discrete set, okay? Finite or countably infinite like the integers, All right? But when we say two dimensional, well, you've already seen that with the Reed frost model that you did in the previous examples. So then you treat your state space as being X, T and Y, T. So models one and two, let's think of models one and two. Model one, I mean, all you need to remember in model one, and let me do some erasing now, so since model one is all about susceptible and infected and you have N people in the population, if I, you know, if I tell you how many are infected and how many are susceptible, uh, complement N minus that, right? So you, you don't need the other coordinate. You'll see that in the book, um, there's discussion on both coordinates, you know, X and Y, but sometimes the other one is completely implied from the first, okay? So you could say, in model one, you don't need that. Similarly for model two, model two is just like model one and it's actually not really discussed in the book, um, okay? And you, you move, you can also move backwards. After you've been infected, you can become susceptible again. But just knowing how many are infected or alternatively how many are susceptible tell you how many are 
of the other category. That's model one and two. For model three and four, you know, denote the Markov chain xt comma yt with a more complicated state space that you'll need to devise. Okay, and throughout this problem, kill this kind of social distance and stuff's not to exist, and the uh, A, which is exogenous, getting sick from the bats is not going to exist, and losing immunity is not going to exist. Okay, all right. So then here, this is really a modeling problem uh, where you have some of the answers in the book anyway. So, you know, for model one, let xt represent the number of susceptible and what is it that's easy in terms of that and what and write the generator matrix. So actually fill out the entries of this matrix, you know, q equals da 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 Okay. And do that for model two. Uh, and more typos. Oh my God, I'm sorry. So for model three, let xt represent st and yt represent it. So you know if you've got st and it, there's still the third category rt. Okay. So again, you, you remember, keep in mind there are n people in the population. So if you know how many are s and how many are i, you know how many are r. Okay. But your state space is now a bit more complicated. It's just a two-dimensional state space and write the general matrix. And model four is a slight generalization. So model four, you can lose immunity. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. Now, this is, this is in a sense a question to get started on. And I would hope that most of you do it rather quickly. I mean, of course, the project is due in 20 days, but uh, I think that's okay. So, so, but do do the question rather quickly, and then you know we can we can do it's nineteen days. So do the question quickly, and then we can discuss over it. And then the other questions we will will discuss later on or uh, answer uh, your questions later on. I'll just say that this one, this last one, which seems kind of small, it's it's a slightly more open ended one. So a few of them are are slightly more open ended in general. Uh, I mean, not in the sense that they're unsolvable, but just that there are multiple ways to present your solution. And I should have feedback on your other assignments um, soon. So hopefully middle of next week, and then you could see how you did on the, I mean, on project one. All right. Any questions more here? No. Okay, um, now what I want to do now is um, is look at statistics with Julia 10 uh, with you guys because this is really the kind of the very simple overview of um, of continuous time Markov chains. Okay, so I think I, I mean there's scribbles here, so I think I described it, uh, I touched touched a bit of it last week or when we met last, but um, let's do that. So, because I want us to see how to simulate a continuous time Markov chain. Now, I actually thought to do this live encoding, but at the level that you are now, I'm not sure there's value in this. Does anybody kind of think that me doing it live gives more value than actually discussing it? That means we spend less time speaking, other, speaking about other things. Tell me what you think. I mean, if everybody, if somebody's, if a few people, if, if a significant number of people is keen to see this live, then we can, you know, we can run this type of thing live. But otherwise, I'd, I'd, I'd describe what's happening um, not live. Anybody? Thoughts, views? Am I speaking to myself? There's always the fear of, of uh, audio education with distance that you've been speaking to yourself for 15 minutes. Is that the case? I'm here by myself. Okay, it's just me. Nobody. I've lost the class. I don't know. No, I'm sorry. We can still hear you. Um, Thank you. I. Okay. Thanks, my audio is being a bit weird. Um, I don't <laughs> think that the live code. I think I prefer more conceptual explanations than yeah. live code, but I obviously can't speak for everybody. 
Well, you certainly can. Alistair, you're the only one that spoke, so thanks a lot for uh, confirming that the lesson is still taking place. No, good stuff. All right, so we, we'll, we'll do the conceptual. And, and I think, yeah, you've, you've, but you'll need to do a, a lot of this type of coding in the assignment, but you could do that. You've done it for that. Thanks. So this here in uh, SWJ, okay, so I'll, I'll follow that track. So we're in SWJ10, and this is the simple, lightweight, non-rigorous introduction to continuous time Markov chains, okay? So I'll just go over it extremely quickly. So this is a Markov property, you've seen it already in SP1, okay? And there are different ways to define a continuous time Markov chain, and as I just said a few minutes ago, there's, here's one of them, and it's a, it's one is to define, sorry, but I mean to parameterize, and this is a generator matrix, okay? So. What I see here, when I, I, the associated diagram, which I see for this problem, I see there's state one, say, and state two, and state three, if I decide to call these the states, state one, two, and three, and one, two, and three. And I just see that there are rates. There is a rate of one going from state one to two, that's this one, and there's a rate of two going from state one to three, okay? Rates are not probabilities, but what I know, I know by this, I know that the probability of x h equaling 3, for example, given that x0 was 1, is 2 times h plus little o of h. Okay, this is, this is what this rate means. Okay, so I know that, and that, that for small h going from state one to state three is with the probability that's proportional to h. Of course, if you take h to zero, this all becomes zero. But this little o of h means that if you now divide everything by h, okay, if I divide everything by h and divide by h and divide by h and, by h and take, take h to zero, then the limit of this is just gonna be two because this is little o of h, it vanishes. Okay, so that's, that's, that's how we can view rates. Again, physically view it as a little Poisson clock at rate two that pulls you to state three. Okay, so that's kind of roughly described here. Now, you can actually dissociate a discrete time Markov chain with a continuous time Markov chain, and you can associate a few different chains. We already spoke actually about two. We spoke about the uniformized one, and we spoke about the embedded one. There's also the skeleton one. The skeleton one would be the first thing you'd actually think about. And the skeleton one, what you would do is you'd say, okay, you'd, you have your continuous time process X um, T delta, and now you can get a discrete time process, which just takes uh, steps of delta, right? So you've got delta and delta and delta and delta. And, you know, it's like you're taking your continuous time chain and you're sampling it every delta. That's kind of, in a sense, the most sensible thing to do. Well, it turns out that what you're going to do here, the transition probability matrix of this xt of delta is just going to be e to the power q delta. Okay, so this this is going to be a, uh, a stochastic matrix. Okay, and you can also approximate e to the power q delta. I mean the we're dealing here, and you'll see this, I think, more in the tutorial today. Um, and if, if, if you'll need more specific help with matrix exponentials, just saying we'll do this. But we're, doing, we're dealing with matrix exponentials, so, so the e to the power a is just where a is a matrix, a is a square matrix, okay? a is a square matrix is just a series, okay, where these are matrix powers. Right? So then if you stick a T here, you stick a scalar T, then you have here a T here. Okay, and that's the matrix exponential. Right? So you define the matrix exponential where A to the power zero is defined to be the identity matrix. So that's how you get these kind of two terms. And, if, and you're dividing by K factorial, right? K factorial or zero factorial equals one and also one factorial equals one. That's how you get these kind of first two terms. Okay, so this is all nice and good. This doesn't say a whole lot. But the point is that there's now a, uh, the, the 
typical algorithm to uh, the standard algorithm for simulating a continuous time lock of chain. And from my perspective, this is an algorithm you can use um, for the homework assignment. It's called the Gillespie algorithm. I think we call it in this book, the Dube Gillespie algorithm. So Gillespie was like a chemist, uh, you know, with good intuitions, etc. And Dube was a probabilist with, uh, that added more rigor to things. Uh, Dube is, is a big guy in probability from 70, 80 years ago. So in the Gillespie algorithm, what you do is you look at the embedded Markov chain or the jump chain. Okay, so the embedded Markov chain is the discrete time Markov chain. I've, I've spoke, said it here, spoken about it two minutes ago, but let me speak about it again. Where Pij, the transition probability from i to j, is first of all, it's zero from you don't go from a state to itself because the whole thing in a continuous time Markov chain, you stay in a state, you're all the time in state. So let's just speak about the jump time. And then you're going to go from i to j with this probability. Okay, so Pij embedded, also called the jump chain, okay, is going to be qij, sometimes written with little q, minus qii, okay, sometimes written as this whole thing is lambda i, if you'd like, okay, for i not equaling j, or zero for i equaling j, okay. Just to see a basic example, sometimes the embedded chain can be very, 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 very boring. So, um, for example, take the example, the two-state chain, two-state continuous time Markov chain, okay? The two-state continuous time Markov chain has, say, state, let's call it state one and state two, okay, where you go here with probability with rate, not probability lambda, and here with rate mu, okay? It's also a birth death continuous time Markov chain. We'll speak about birth death, and that's also in your homework as well. Okay, birth death chains means that you only move one state to the right or one state to the left. That's birth death. Here, you don't have too many options. You only have two states. So the generator matrix is, my, we spoke about this last week, is this. Whoops. What's the embedded chain? What's the embedded chain of this continuous time Markov chain? So that's the generator matrix. What's the embedded chain? So the embedded chain is when you make a jump from state one, what's, where are you gonna go? Right, so the embedded chain follows, what was it? Uh, here, this, it was big, is this. So what's the embedded chain? Zero, one, one, zero. Thanks, Emily, good job. All right, so zero, one, one, zero. Okay, so that's the embedded chain, all right. Uh, I mean, in this case, the embedded chain really doesn't have information. You're just changing state, 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 state. I mean, this is a discrete time Markov chain that's periodic and um, moves from state one state to the other, okay? Now, if you know the embedded chain, you don't have all of the information of the continuous time Markov chain. There's some information missing. Information that's missing, one way to view the information missing is the entries in the diagonal, okay? Which is the actual rates, okay? So if you were going to say construct a two-state Markov chain with the embedded chain, right, then you would, you know, you'd need to be in state. And this embedded chain is very, very boring. With two states, the embedded chain cannot do too many things, okay? That's kind of the point with the embedded chain in two states, okay? Three states, it can already get dazzling. So, you know, you're here in state one and you can go to either state one or state two. Of course, from one, you're going to always to state two and your state two, you're going always to state one, okay? Um, but the question is, how long are you going to stay in state one? So what's the mean duration that you would stay in state one when I'm in state one in a continuous time Markov chain? How long am I going to stay in state one? What's my expected mean duration of staying in state one? If I'm in state one. Emily Wilkins, it's all up to you. What's the mean duration in state one? or Alistair, or Janina, or anybody else, or Ashley. How long are we staying in state one? 
it's not like this is going up to YouTube or anything. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to stay in each state uh, exponential duration with this parameter without the minus, right? So the mean duration state one would be one on lambda. The mean duration state two would be one on mu, et cetera. Okay. Exponential with parameter, Isabel wrote it with parameter lambda. Yep, well done. Okay, so that's a distribution of duration state one and the mean is one on lambda. Well done. Too. All right, good. Now, so once you know the embedded chain and you've got it, and you guys, you guys are like super experts how to generate from a discrete time Markov chain, all you need to do is you need to take the time between event to be exponential according to these parameters, okay? And that's Lube Gillespie. And it's kind of important here that what's happening is that the duration of time that you are at the state is completely independent of where you're gonna go at the end. It doesn't have to, I mean, you know, it wouldn't have to be this way, right? In a slightly more general stochastic process, you could say, hey, there's a stochastic process where, so I'm actually working on a, on a paper like that on something called semi-Markov processes, which is not my invention. Many people are working on that and it's for biomedicine, okay? So I'm working on that with a friend, Benoit Lique, okay? Colleague, whatever, the person. So you can be in a state for a duration and so say you're in hospital and you're either on a respirator, knock wood, or, on, uh, uh, or not, okay? After a respirator, maybe you move to oxygen, back to oxygen, or, or you move to like life support, like serious life support. So you're a respirator. So let's say your duration and respirator follows some distribution. Then, you know, the state you will go to after you finish that duration will, de will depend on how long you've been in the respirator, right? There should be some dependence. In continuous time Markov chains, that breaks. That doesn't happen. So you're going to stay the state for an exponential duration. And afterwards, you're going to flip a coin independently according to these probabilities. In this case, these are degenerate probabilities because your better chain is two-state chain is degenerate. You're going to go to that state. So that's Dub Gillespie. So let's actually see how that happens. Okay, so we'll just, just look at this and make sense of, of this code. So we haven't done this for a while, actually looking at code, but let's see. So this is Dub Gillespie. It gets uh, his input a time horizon T, and it gets a generator matrix Q, okay, generator, and it gets the initial probability. I mean, why do we need initial probability? Well, we need to start in some state, okay? So first we read the size of the state space, like how many states there are, okay? And then what we build here is we're building here the embedded chain, okay? So what this does basically is does exactly PIJ equals uh, QIJ divided by QII minus if I not equal to J or zero if I equal to J. Okay, that's that's what this code does. That's not a critical thing, but it does this thing. Okay, so your lambda vector, you can treat that as your, just like Isabel uh, Peters said, the exponential with parameter lambda, right? So these are the diagonals of the Q minus the diagonals of the Q. Okay, now we're going to start our initial state. Well, we have to choose from one on n according to the weights of initial probability. Okay, often initial probability will be something of the form like zero, 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 one, zero, 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 like a degenerate initial probability. But maybe it's not. Maybe we're starting initially with a random state. Like I think that in most of your homework assignments, it would be we're start, we're, most of the homework assignment, we're starting with one infected or something like that. Okay, so it'll be. Initial probability is the general. Now, the phrase sojourn time, sojourn, sojourn, how long you're in a state, okay? So you're gonna be a um, rand with an exponential random variable, and this is the mean of the exponential. This thing is a mean, so the mean is, that's how you give parameters to an exponential random variable. In Julia, you give uh, the mean, you don't give the rate. So it's one over the lambda vec, of state i. So this is basically exponential lambda i, where i is your state. Okay? I mean, that state was now randomly drawn. So we've got that first time. Good. And time is zero. So what we've done so far is we've 
we've taken time here. We've, we, let's say the states can be one, two, and three. Okay, so let's say that n was three in this case. We've taken now sojourn time, okay? And let's say we, we had here state happen to be two randomly, so we're here. And now we took sojourn time to be of this length, okay? This is, this is a sojourn time. Okay, now we just need to continue running. So now we're gonna add to t the sojourn time and we'll see that we didn't uh, overcome our final horizon capital T, okay? And let's increment the time, okay? So we've now moved the time from here, time, the time variable was zero, let's increment it to this, okay, to this. This is now t, okay, so we're at line 24. What do we do now? Now the question is, where we go? Where we go? Where we go is just going to be according to either here or here or here. It's gonna be like a discrete choice. According to, and this is the same line of code that you've had when you simulated discrete time options, right? So you're, you're sampling from the state row Okay, so if your state with two, it would be like the second row or whatever of the embedded probability discrete time Markov chain. Then your sojourn time is going to be according to your new state. So you've, what you've done here at this, at this line, at line 25, you've actually moved. So let's say this happened to be state three. Okay, so, so then you imagine you have a circle here and you move here to state three like that. And now you're getting a new sojourn time, and that sojourn time is maybe this, okay? So you've got the sojourn time, and you add, now you add it to T, and you continue going like this until you reach capital T. That's it. Questions? And you return the state in the end. I mean, this is, this, this is a bit of a, all this Duke Gillespie does is just returns the state at that specific time. I mean, a better algorithm or a better implementation, well, I don't know better, depending for what would have kind of recorded all of these points. Okay, there's actually one like that below. Questions about that? Okay, so just so you actually see an example of that, of what I just said a better. So here is, here is a different Doob Gillespie. Okay, here's a different Doob Gillespie. And this is the next example. And it does it in, it, it, it's different in two ways, okay? So we only got a few minutes, but I'll, I'll quickly explain how it's different. So you actually master this thing and then that's all the simulation you pretty much need for your homework. Um, and it's, it's quite useful for a lot of things. But you need to understand what this thing MM1 is. Now we'll spend more time speaking about queues, but I'll say now very, very briefly, okay? So an MM1 queue, so is a stochastic model of a, coffee stand, that's what it is. It's a coffee stand stochastic model where you've got a single person making the coffee, okay? That's the server and you've got here, this is a, it's a coffee stand in a civilized country, okay? Where people stand in line. So where I come with, where I grew up, there's no line. Everybody kind of runs at the coffee stand and pushes each other onto the coffee stand. And that, was, that was previously. Oh, now Australia's changed, and, and it's was no, it, was no, it no, no. Everyone has to queue now. Everyone has to queue, one point five meters apart. All oh, right, now it's like even crazy, right? You've even got yeah, of course. All right, so the the thing is that you've got these people queuing. This person is a server, okay? So a simple and of course, you know, this guy is making coffee. Now there's two effects of randomness here. There's how long this this person here is making the coffee. That's a server, okay? And there's, you know, how many people come here? So guess what? What arrival process do we use for the arrival of people? Poisson, yeah. okay? Awesome. People come, people arrive according to a Poisson process at rate lambda, okay? So the average number of people that come in a single time unit is lambda. So they arrive according to Poisson process. Now there might be a suddenly a big gap and then you know these, these people get their coffee. See, uh, no coffee. Coffee stand person gets to update their Instagram, right? But then somebody else came and etc. Okay, so that's that. Now in the MM1 queue, what's the simplest distribution to choose for the distribution of time it takes a person to make coffee? What's the most natural distribution? We've got to finish class, so you got to throw yeah. some distribution. Uniform? Uniform, right? So that's what I would think too, because if you don't know anything, you kind of, kind of like if you're not in the 
in these models, uniform seems like the most basic thing, but actually uniform is harder to handle. What's the most natural distribution of continuous time Markov chains? You might have forgotten it. <laughs> exponential. Isabel didn't forget it. Okay, so an exponential distribution, right? So if you say Poisson arrivals, Poisson arrivals with exponential service times, then it really fits very nicely in the framework of continuous time Markov chains. You can also do uniform, but actually that's more complicated. And that deals with things in queuing theory that we won't speak about in this course. But if that's okay? exponential, does it mean that they, they do it faster and faster and faster? No, it just means that if this person makes coffee and, and she's been making coffee already for five minutes, it doesn't change the probability of her finishing to make coffee in the next minute. Okay, it's like right. the chatty, it's the chatty coffee maker. Okay. It's, never, yeah. It's just that when I hear the word exponential, I think of like algorithms that don't finish and <laughs> all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> no. It's, it, so the the critical thing about exponential is it's constant hazard rate. It's it's memoryless. It's not that it doesn't finish. It's that you know that amount of time that has passed does not affect what has happened. So the memoryless property that we spoke about extensively, especially you and me. Oh, yeah. You did. All right, that one. Okay, so if you do this and you have your stochastic process X of T measuring the number of people in the queue. And here is, by the way, a realization of this one. See, the number of people in the queue. So number of people in the queue over time, you got like 20, you started with 20, it's gone down. It's all, it's, notice that there's these discrete things, okay? Et cetera, et cetera, number of people in the queue, okay? Here, for this case, rho is 0 0.7, so that means that, for example, lambda is 0 0.7 and mu is 1. So the mean time between arrivals is 1 on 0 0.7, and the mean service time is 1, okay? Otherwise, this would tend to statistically grow. But you still have stochastic fluctuations in the queue, as you do in the coffee stand. The nice thing is that this is nothing but a continuous time Markov chain, where you go from state 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., it's with countably infinite state space. If there's zero people in the queue, your rate of getting one person in the queue is lambda. If there's one person in the queue, queue is, by the way, in the system. This is a person standing in front of the coffee stand being served, okay? If there's one person in the queue, well, there's a race between two things. There's either a second person will arrive, that happens with parameter lambda, with rate lambda, or person will get served out and that's mu. And that's your negative in the diagonal. And then it just continues with constant mu here and constant lambda there. Okay. And even there's a nice stationary distribution to this, which happens to be geometric. We'll speak about that more later. But just to finish off, this here, and read this yourself, please, because we're going to finish. This here is the Dube Gillespie algorithm for this case, where we don't specifically give the generator matrix. We can't even specify the generator matrix is infinite. Okay, but it, the rates are either exponential at lambda or exponential at mu. Okay, so try to try to see how that works. And this Dube Gillespie also records the times of jumps, so it, the t values and the q values. So then you can actually plot the trajectory like that. Questions? Okay, so I'll put this recording up. I'll uh, fix a few typos. We've got a visit our Tuesday after the lecture Tuesday where um, we'll continue speaking a bit on this and then continue with the, your, your reading. That's in that guide. Any final questions? Okay, have a good weekend. Work well. I suggest starting on the first problem of the assignment. See you. Bye-bye. Thanks. See you. Thanks. See you.